Well, good afternoon and welcome to this week's edition of The Fireplace Show. And our subject matter today is going to be all about why flue lining is required in chimneys and the purpose of flue liners in masonry chimneys. My co-presenter today is a gentleman I've known for many, many years. He's coming to us from Iowa. His name is Tom Urban, and right now we're having a little bit of internet issues in Iowa, so hopefully Tom will be joining me very shortly. He'll be coming in as soon as he can get the internet working properly out there, which should hopefully just be a few minutes. Now, let's first of all, let's cover why is flue lining a part of a masonry chimney, and why is flue lining required in all building codes and standards? And to know that, we've got to understand what the purpose of the flue liner is, why it's installed in there. And some years ago, for the Chimney Safety Institute of America, I was in charge of a committee that did research into the history and the background of masonry chimneys, along with some other friends, some other volunteers, and also a technical uh, company that also did the, the writing of this. And we produced a manual, a technical journal called Chimney Fires, Causes, Effects, and Evaluations. And this was published in 1992. So in the works of the research for this, we did a lot of research into the background of masonry chimneys and where clay lining was first used. See, the material that's predominantly used in American chimneys is made out of clay, and we call it clay tile. It can be called terracotta. It's also referred to as a vitreous clay material in the chimney. So, as we go through this, the first, the most oldest structures that we found where clay flue lining was recommended was in 19... 79. Hello, James. Appreciate you joining me here today, brother. Welcome to the show. So anyway, as we went through this research, we found that codes and standards only started calling for clay tile in certain areas of the country in the early parts of the 20th century. In fact, some parts of the, of the United States, the local codes and standards, did not require it until into the late 80s at some, some states. But the purpose of the clay tile, why was it put in the chimneys and what's it there for? A lot of people think that the clay tile is there for, so strictly for uh, safety. However, the clay tile is actually used to protect the fragile chimney itself, the masonry materials from the acid attack of the flue gases. And in research done by the United States government through the 1940s by various testing agencies, they did further research about the acids that are in the chimney. And you say, I want to clarify something here. The safety of the chimney is contingent upon the clearances of the chimney. What are the clearances of the chimney to the materials that surround it? If you look over my right hand shoulder back here, I've actually got a cutaway of a masonry chimney in in my background today. And so you can see the arrow that's pointing at the flue liner. Flue liner is, is found in either 24 inch or 12 inch sections, depending on the part of the country that you're looking at the chimneys at. And in between these clay tile, when they're put into the chimney, is cement, mortar. Now, until the late 1980s, you could use regular mortar, just like you build your house with between those clay tiles. And this was to set them together. It was a gasketing material. That's why it was placed in the chimney. Now I see my friend Tom coming in. Let me bring Tom on camera. Tom, you there now, brother? Well, I'm on my phone right now. <laughs> it just went dead just real quick. So, okay, so we're trying to go back to a, to a cable thing right now. So anyway, I'm, yeah, I'm trying to work off my phone. Gotcha. So, Tom, I'm going to bring you up to where I'm at right now. I have just went through why clay flue lining was put in the chimneys, where we found where 1870s was where the first usage of clay tile, which was the predominant chimney liner. I brought it up into the early parts of the 20th century when codes and standards started <laughs> reflecting the need for clay tiles. And then I went through some of the testing that was done by the United States government in the 40s that signified the problem of acid in masonry chimneys. Hello, Lee. I'm glad you're seeing us with you here today. Welcome, my friend. We're talking about clay liners, Lee. So as we go through this, as we keep going through, Tom, I'm up into 
the 1940s, and I went in that some areas of the country that flu lining was not even a part of codes and standards until the 1980s. Now, the thing I had done right before you came into, I talked about the mortar in between the flu tiles and where in codes and standards up until the late 80s, we were seeing just regular mortar specified with between the flu tiles, where it's the same mortar you build the house out of. And in the late 80s into the early 90s, codes and standards started to change because we found that mortar was failing in the chimney. Now, like I explained a little bit ago, and we're going to, since Tom was not here to start with, I'm kind of going to backtrack a little bit. I told you guys that are listening that in the 1990s, I was in charge of a committee at an, an educational foundation called the Chimney Safety Institute of America. And we did research into the history of clay tiles and we published that journal, the one I showed you a while ago, Chimney Fires, Causes, Effects, and Evaluations, which taught us a lot about this. And if you're listening from the aspect of a consumer, so you're aware, Tom, if I say that you and I have taught thousands of chimney sweep technicians and business owners, the things we're talking about today, would you agree with that thousands of people that we've had the privilege of teaching over our careers? Yep, that's for sure. Yeah, we have thousands. Okay, so to give you a little more background, I want Tom to tell you a little bit about himself because Tom was in this industry in the 1970s. And Tom, you started lining chimneys that were unlined or damaged in the 70s. Tell me a little bit about what you were seeing and how you started doing this, sir. Okay. Sure. Um, I started sweeping chimneys in, uh, after doing a stint in the Peace Corps with my wife. We came back to Northeast Pennsylvania, and that was the craze for wood stoves, um, you know, Jimmy Carter, the whole nine yards. And we started sweeping chimneys just to get some revenue. Well, it blossomed into something larger than what we ever thought it would blossom into. And yet the, the cool part is there was nothing, literally nothing that was available. All that was, was built were outside masonry chimneys that were put up quickly and they were put in with these things, these guys right here, these clay liners that you're seeing. And they were failing at an extremely rapid rate. And because the outside cold, the wood was too wet, and the story can go on and on. But the real key thing is they start they were they were falling apart in chimney fires, house fires. And really how this the problem I realized quickly that whatever we were doing, I needed to find some way of documenting what was happening because a lot of people just didn't didn't believe me. The old school was that hey chimney fires happen yeah, that's how you clean out your chimney you have a chimney fire and life goes on well unfortunately that wasn't really the, the real case that was that was that was actually happening so we designed and built a camera system that we could use to lower inside the chimney and my first one was in uh, 1983 and i was working with an insurance adjuster at the time who like myself was extremely frustrated because he didn't know what he was writing money for and he was trying to come up with a, a documentative way of understanding what was really going on inside the chimneys. So he and I teamed up and I spent about a year, year and a half in a truck with him and on every Friday. And we would go around all Northeastern Pennsylvania, Southern New York, looking at chimney fires. Um, besides that, Esther and I had our own service company where we, we began to reline chimneys. Like Jerry said, there was really nothing out there at the time. So my first liners, um, I had to roll. I found a sheet metal man I worked with and showed me how to, to shear the sheet and how to, you know, do a Pittsburgh lock and make it and make a crimped end for it and whatnot. We used 304 stainless steel. I learned how to make tees by hand. So it was, um, I learned a great craft of, of metalworking and at the same time learning how to line chimneys. That progressed into, we need insulation around us. So we started using loose fill for Miculite. And that turned out to be a fiasco because it leaked everywhere. <laughs> it was terrible to get into it which then led itself to work with ceramic blanket as far as an insulating, an insulating blanket to keep the liners warm. Um, so that's what I started out with literally nothing at that time. And, and within the course of four or five years, we had lined several hundreds of chimneys and uh, the use of the camera systems, we were able to document the, the work we were finding about how bad chimneys really were. So okay. that's kind of a real quick story, Jerry. Right. So let's back it up just a little bit here because what Tom did that was really phenomenal. And I actually met Tom probably about 1983 or 1984. I walked through a trade show and there was a guy showing a camera for inspecting the inside of chimneys. It was really radically different. 
And this is a gentleman that invented that system of a camera system. We call it a documentation device. And see, that's what many chimney sweep technicians use today. When they come to your home as part of a chimney sweep service, they're going to actually take a camera and put it inside of the chimney so we can view the chimney from just inches away. So we're going to talk more about that as we go into that. But again, Remember, right now we're talking about clay flue lining, Tom, and the, what's the problem with clay flue lining. And so we're going to go through a couple problems that your chimney sweep technician may come to your house and tell you about. Okay, and one of the predominant ones, Tom, is the matter of missing mortar between flue tiles. Remember, for years, we were using regular mortar that's just used to lay brick that's not rated for high temperature applications. And what happens often, if you have your chimney swept, Tom, a lot of technicians are going to tell you, you've got missing mortar between these joints. Is that Am I pretty much on the story yeah. of the day? Yeah, actually, what I can actually do, Jerry, is um, since my computer died, I'm on my phone, so I'm going to try to do the best I can with it. But I have here, so let me know if you can see that. This we is can the see inside. Time, Tom. There you go. That's the inside of what a chimney should look like. That's using a non water soluble refractory cement, and it's sealing it all up against the side. So the line has been cut three ways, so we can actually show this to you so you can see what they're supposed to look like. Now, I'm going to take you back over here, and I'm going to move this liner over the way out, out of the way here. And I'm going to set him here for a little bit. Now, this is a regular liner that you that you'd normally look at. Let me back up here a little bit so you can see it. This is what they look like when they're brand new. This, unfortunately, is one that has been used. It's been taken out of the chimney. As you can see, it's all dark and black. And if I move my phone up here a little bit, you can see that it's all dark and black in it. Now, what Jerry is explaining to you is that many times... People will build chimneys, and, and there's a variety of different things. One is that masons don't know when they start working that they need to be sealed with the right cement. The other time happens to be just from wear and tear that the liners begin to move and move around. So what will actually happen is the liners themselves will begin to separate very much like this. So as you can see, there's a gap here like this. So if your chimney sweep's talking to you about gaps or open mortar joints, this is exactly what he's talking about. In some of these cases, these guys can be up here like this, staggered, and you'll see this big, huge, huge opening. It's so bad in some applications that we, we call it the straw effect. And it really what it comes down to is if you've ever gone to a your favorite or just a drive through or whatever where you're getting a, a soft drink or whatever and, and a straw, and if you put the straw into the thing, the lid, pierces the straw and you try to suck on it the next thing you know um you can't you can't suck out because it's, it's pulling air into it well it's the same thing here with chimneys when these things begin to open up like this and uh there we go i'll get my phone out these things open up like this you have a really really tough time um let me see get some little bit help here you have a real tough time the chimney gets to draw because you have to remember chimneys work on negative pressure or basically a vacuum so the most important part about it is once you start breaking this vacuum, it makes it harder and harder for your chimney to do what it's supposed to do. So that's why it's real key that these things be on top of each other. That is refractory cement. And I'll show you on the outside of this one over here like this. This is what you're supposed to have. But in a variety, a lot of take cases, that doesn't happen. From time, wear and tear, water damage, you know, chimney fire damage, you know, lightning strikes, whatever. These things do, unfortunately, is a great material. To, to to vent gases and whatnot, but they really that they they're they're brittle, and unfortunately, um, mo most folks don't understand um, the characteristics that these liners can do. So that's kind of a quick little story about why we why what we do here at this company is design build cameras for that purpose. But it's really we we really want to let the American public understand that chimneys need to be sealed. They need to be able to liner on top of each other with a mortar joint sealing and to, to prevent this from happening. We're having all this stuff come on the outside of the liner when it's supposed to be inside the liner. And that's the real key thing that a lot of, a lot of folks uh, may or may not understand. But I right. do, does that work out for you? Works out good. So let's explain to people this. The clay flue liners, like Tom is showing you right now, they expand and contract with mm -hmm. use. And they turn into all kinds of different shapes. They can actually move around in the chimney. And I actually call it in classes that the flue tiles can walk around and be displaced in the chimney. So there's a lot of problems from this expansion factor.
and the expansion's going on, and that's helping to wear out that mortar that's between those clay tiles. So what happens is probably one of the most common issues that consumers find when a chimney sweep does an inspection, and probably they're going to lower a camera, they're going to find that there is often misaligned flue tiles and missing mortar between those joints. Now, what's the problem with that? Well, here's your problem. Number one, it can leak acids through the clay tile. If you look at the clay tile that Tom is showing you right now, you can see where the outside is coated with the creosote. Now, what's the problem with this? Remember the purpose of that clay flue lining. It was to protect that fragile chimney housing from the acid attacks of those materials. Now, the second thing that happens, and Tom came up with one of the best examples of this, is your chimney is pulling into it. This is what we call draft. Well, if you have gaps in between those flue tiles, what's happening is instead of pulling the draft from the fireplace or from the wood stove, all of a sudden the air comes into the chimney itself through those gaps. And what this can cause, it can cause the smoke the byproducts of combustion to spill into the home. Tom, you've compared this to a drinking straw. Let's talk yep, about the drinking straw comparison a minute. Well, that's the, the key thing, Jerry, is if you physically understand that when you have a hole in the straw that you're, you, you're sucking and sucking and sucking and you're getting air and you're getting part of your beverage. That's the same thing your chimney's doing. It's working as hard as it can, but it, again, it's being defeated by the amount of dilution air coming in. The unfortunate, and it's, a, it's like a twofold thing. I'll try to keep it so I don't get too technical. If you have hot gases going up inside the chimney and you have openings into it, you allow dilution air to come in. By adding the dilution air, you start to cool the smoke and the gases inside there. When they cool, they begin to condense. And when they condense, it's like a, a sweating glass uh, with ice in it during a summer day. That's exactly what it begins to do. It bubbles and it comes down. So you end up with situations like what I have right in the top of these chimneys. They come down and all that stuff. I'm going to lift this guy up here and show you. This is how he was put in the chimney at the time. They were took they took it out together. But this is what's happened. So that thing has sweated enough that now it's come down, it's leaked through, and now it's on the outside of the, of the chimney itself. This is really what we don't want to have. We want these are to contain the products of combustion, not allow combustion gases and condensates coming out. So there's... Thousands, if not millions of chimneys in the United States right now, they're probably looking very much like this one. And that's what makes them, one, a, a poor performer. They won't work as well as they can. And two, if any other um, restrictions that come through at the top or the bottom will also cause the chimney not to work very well. And if you're in a tighter home, then it makes it even that much tougher for the gases to actually work. Right. So I, I kind of took a lot of stuff and put it together for you, but this was actually taken out of a chimney. The chimney was actually, the exterior was, taken apart and these liners were lifted out very ever so carefully so that I could we can actually show you what they look like we tell you about it we see them inside with the camera but we don't see them outside okay so let's give another potential issue if this creosote like I said is leaking through those joints through different areas what's going to happen is it's going to cause an acid attack if you go back to what you learned in your science classes the masonry materials are alkaline so when the acid touches it, we have a chemical reaction, which results in premature deterioration of the chimney that can result in a very expensive rebuilding of the chimney down the road. So what we're looking for in a chimney system is we want a flue liner that's basically gas tight. I want you to think if you could inject air into that chimney, a half a pound of pressure, it should hold that pressure if the chimney is proper. In many European countries, that's how they test chimneys is by pressure testing them. OK, so that's the that's some of the problems. Now, Tom, I want you to focus your camera in on the flue tile right in front of you. There's a great big crack running down the front of that clay tile. You see it? There you yep. go. OK, so what I want everybody to focus into, that is what we would call a cracked tile. Now, the predominant reason that tiles get cracked is because they suffer damage from what we call thermal shock. And this thermal shock, I'm going to explain this in the simplest terms that I can. 
And what's happening in thermal shock is we are raising the interior temperature of that flu lining very rapidly. The flu lining is actually an excellent insulator. So the heat doesn't pass rapidly through it. So what's happening here is we have a stress on the inside of the chimney. And the inside of the chimney is going under what we classify in ceramic and in, in, in scientific terms as compression stress. And it's four to eight times stronger than the outside of the chimney that is under what we call tensile stress or tension. So what this is doing, it's, it's trying to rip the material apart. And after it reaches a certain degree, what we call the temperature differential, where the inside of the clay tile and the outside of the clay tile differ in temperature at approximately 450 to 550 degrees on a square or rectangular tile, fracturing will occur. On a round tile in our studies, it can take up to 850 degrees for that damage to occur due to the shape. Now, one of the problems of clay flue lining is it is a ceramic cylinder. And by being a ceramic cylinder, it exerts a lot of stress that causes cracking to these chimneys. Remember, it's expanding, it's, contra it's contracting. If you could measure the clay tile when it's heated, you would see that it gets thicker and it gets taller. It can actually grow inside of chimneys. We can find cases where it actually picks up the top couple feet of chimney and can raise it up. And we find on the outside of the chimney, a cracking we call a circumferential crack. But that is from thermal shock because a chimney fire will rapidly raise the temperature up. But I also want to let you know that even furnaces, when they fire up in extremely cold areas, if you live up in the cold northeast and your chimney is down at zero or below, <coughs> excuse me, and your oil furnace comes on, an older oil furnace can actually put temperatures in very rapidly up to 650 degrees. And this can cause cracking of a chimney from that thermal shock. So, Tom, what would you add in about thermal shock and what I've told people here? Actually, I can just show you by example, Jerry. I've got this aligner here that they went through some thermal thermal shocking here and it's broken apart. So, as you can see, I can, I can put this chimney right together just like this. All right. You can also see that this is probably the top liner because that line that you're talking about was right here. And as you can see from the sides, all the smoke, smoking and stuff that was on, that was ex it was exhausting outside the liner was against here. And again, now if I do it this way, I will pull the liner apart, and you can actually see where they where they where they are separated, and also see where the, how much of the condensate whatnot has all come through this so that so you can see just that leaked right through so crack liners open mortar joints all contribute to the fact that you begin to lose drafting capabilities within the system and you end up with with um, condensate and gases going places that it shouldn't go so so these are the various things that go on and often when p you know this is one of the things about chimneys most chimneys are never inspected in this country Probably less than 3% of American consumers have ever had a chimney professionally inspected by someone who is trained to diagnose that has the tooling to do it. Earlier this week, I attended a chimney inspection, Tom. Believe it or not, this inspector brought out three different of your cameras to inspect this chimney because what we needed was we used your Enviro camera, we used a straightforward lens, and we also used a lighthouse. But the problem was there were severe offsets in that chimney. So we had to inspect it from top down, from that bottom up, and we had to go to a smaller camera with a flexible end to get up past those offsets. You understand where I'm coming from? Yeah. So thermal shock, what else would you add in with this? Now, last week, folks, if you go back and look at our last show, it was all about creosote. But what happens is, according to studies by Dr. Jay Shelton in the 1970s, in a book entitled Wood Heat Safety, Dr. Shelton predicted that a chimney fire could occur from as little as 78 hours of improper burning. That's right, 78 
hours. Now that if you also notice what I said, I said from improper burning, because as we went over in our show last week, what causes creosote is lowered flue gas temperatures. And Tom was talking a while ago about the condensation that's put inside of the chimney system. So these are the problems. And like I said, what we're doing with this show is we are prepared. We're broadcasting this show for consumers. This show is not made for chimney technicians, even though we hopefully got a lot on here. And if you guys are do out there, we welcome you to share this show on your own social channels to help educate your customers in your market area. So Tom, anything else about that? Because we've talked about various factors here that damage these clay tiles. What else would you bring into that discussion? Um, Oh, boy, that's, that's, <laughs> how much time we got, Jerry? Okay. The, uh, I think that I think the most most key key point I think that if I was willing to, to talking to homeowners is is the the fact that these things need to be sealed. If they were inside a home, they're better than when they're exterior. If they are exterior, if there's a way to somehow insulate it so that you can keep the temperature up, I think a lot of folks are expecting chimneys to do things, especially on an exterior format, you know, where it's outside the house envelope that they cool down so rapidly that it is really, really tough sometimes to keep a fire going because it, or keep the draft going, which means you end up having to put more wood on the fire and whatever to keep the thing going so that you can keep the heat generated versus if you were the chimney was insulated like they did in the old days, you know, back in the 16, 17, 1800s, they made sure the chimneys were on the inside of the house. And the reason they did that was to be, try to keep the chimney as warm as possible. And at the same time, also get, you know, we're able to get more heat off the chimney before exhaust it out exterior onto the exterior. Um, that made a huge difference when it's inside or how well they, 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 they draft from, from time. So I think that's what, I, what I'd want homeowners to understand is that these, the, you know, the joints themselves, anything that, that opens the chimney up to, to the ability that this is what, this is what happens um, is what is, um, is the most important. Yeah. You know, here's a couple of comments that are coming in. They're on some of the Facebook channels that staggering statistics, keys, phrase, and evaluation failure to contain the products of combustion, which is the smoke and gases, those kind of things. So we're seeing a lot of comments coming in because we're broadcasting on eight different Facebook channels and YouTube right now. So we see some come in. When you come into our show, you've got to really let StreamYard know that you're coming in. That way we can put, you'll see your comments. I'd love to flash them up here on the screen. There's nothing better than seeing something like what my friend James Owen said here. I highly recommend the book you wrote back in the early nineties, Chimney Fires, Cause and Effects. I learned a lot from that book. And that's what's happened to the whole industry. And actually, so what we're going to do now, we told you about clay flue lining. Clay flue lining is in most masonry chimneys when they're built in the United States. But as we came into the chimney sweep industry and Tom entered this industry before I did, but still I was in the early eighties. Tom was in the late seventies. So what we saw in the chimney service industry was we saw that clay flue lining was starting to fail from chimney fires or many chimneys never were lined. So Tom was one of the truly innovators back in those days. So Tom saw a need and like he told you earlier, he started making his own stainless steel liner in a fabrication shop in Northeast Pennsylvania. But as the industry grew, what happened was we had manufacturers that came out with various types of relining materials for lining chimneys. At first we had rigid pipe where it was in straight sections with elbows. Then we started having flexible stainless steel pipe. Now, Tom, in your background, in your career, and he's showing you some, that's rigid pipe. He's holding his hand with a T-section. You'll see there's cor there's corrugated stainless. We've had a lot of different stainless steel materials using interlock stainless, using corrugated smooth wall. And today the, the choices in lining materials for a chimney lining contractor are pretty vast what's out there. But the key thing was we were trying to provide a system that could contain those combustion products. Now, during this, we also came to a determination that we needed to insulate these. 
And in the history of insulation of flu liners and the development of various stainless steels, we have went through various alloys of stainless steel. In the early 80s, you would see 400 series used. Then we saw 304 and 300 series. Today, I would say the predominant stainless steel alloy is 316. But we also had various types of insulators. One type is mixed with, it comes in a bag, that your contractor is going to mix with water on the job site and pour in behind the, the new stainless steel liner. The other is they're going to use a ceramic wool blanket. And Tom, I think you were involved in the development of the ceramic wool blanket. Am I correct? Yeah, I was. After I lost enough vermiculite in people's yards and, and filtering out and zooming up a chimney or whatnot, we just thought that we needed to find something more reliable. Um, I think it was about 1980, maybe 83, 84, when we stopped at an insulation plant and we found a ceramic blanket. And then we went through the different styles and types and densities and whatnot. And when we, uh, when I was working for Copperfield, we took the, the entire process through the, through this, the testing, pro, the, the UL testing is when the second time around is when we began to use um, the insulated blankets versus uh, the pour in style of insulation. Okay. And, uh, the variety of different, yeah, the variety of different thicknesses. The right now today they have um, foil, uh, foil encased uh, materials that you can use in you know four, six, and eight pound densities that that uh, are most probably most common today. Right now, Tom said something a while ago. He said Copperfield. So as you know, Copperfield is not David Copperfield the magician. Copperfield is one of the larger distribution companies and manufacturers in the chimney service industry. So there was a part of Tom's career that you worked for Copperfield as their technical director, I believe. Am I right, Tom? Yes, I was. Yeah. Okay. So I actually followed my my, my second day on a job that happened to be. A, happened to be at UL during the testing procedures for the, for the chimneys, for the chimney liners. So, and then I followed it through the testings and all through the listing processes and that were involved with it too. So yeah, myself and a team of other people, that's for sure to, to get it done. Jerry, did I lose you? I'm not in the sun, but for some reason I turned red. So I apologize for the redness cause we don't know. It's something in the lighting and maybe it'll go away. I don't know what it is. So, so you know, my blood pressure is not running up, but if you see me turning red, maybe if I get closer, whatever, we'll figure out this one part out. Okay. So I apologize for the redness. My blood pressure is not going up. I'm not bad, Tom. So just, we got to clarify that in this show. Okay. <laughs> what's that? What's that guy on Avengers that's red? <laughs> yeah. The red. <laughs> yeah, what can you say? So I just went behind the curtain to try to adjust the lighting. So, Tom, as we went through this, let's talk a little bit about what's happened in the lining industry and the changes that have gone on. Okay. The first, the, the first testing was done was actually getting getting the liner in, using the proper the appropriate uh, lining material um, to, and size properly for the appliance that you're going to working with. Um, that was completed. The next hurdle came down to is while I was working at Copperfield, the situation warranted that. The chimneys had to be designed and built inside a NFPA or IRC designed uh, chimney, which they all had clearances that were supposedly added to it. Well, we came to find out that around the amount of most of America, probably like 63 million chimneys out there, um, a lot of them do not have that air airspace. So what we ended up having to do is a couple things. One, we had to go back and use a higher rated insulating blanket so that we, we could do what was called a zero, zero test, which meant that if the liner was up against the liner wall uh, and if there was no clearance on the outside, that the liner would be able to contain the product's combustion and also keep the heat down below 90 degrees, um, 90 degree temperature from ambient. So that was, the, that was a real, that was the next place we had that they worked on is making sure that you could put a, a, a insulated liner inside a chimney and uh, be able to, to, to match that and keep the clearances away. Then it started getting into the exotic stuff, which was going to be your, you know, we started out with 304, that was 304L, then 321 was used. These are all different styles and types of, uh, of stainless steels, and probably filtered out because the most expensive of them all was 316. In some cases, they're using 316's TI, which has, um, which has some titanium into it. 
So um, those, yeah, so there's been a variety of, of manufacturers have offered products for people. That, but I probably, the mainstay these days, I probably would say most of it's pretty much all, it was all three, 304 and 316. Gotcha. Now, Tom, one of the things was also when you worked at Copperfield and you and I have spent a lot of time relaxing together, but you told me about the time that you found Flugu, <laughs> that, you had, that you had been looking for a mortar to use between flu tiles that would do the job. And you told me about you grabbed a handful of stuff and running down the hall and tell everybody, I found it, I found it, I found it. So do you remember that time, Tom? I, I do remember that time. Yeah, we we were looking for for a supplier to get us some type of a, a, ref, a refactory cement that we could that the Copperfield could offer for using it on on the joints on the top of liners and and also for sealing up different areas where you needed a high high temperature get um, excuse me a high temperature um, uh, cement. So yeah, I was like you know it was kind of like the thing from the jerk you know I'm somebody I'm somebody I found this I found the stuff and so yeah that was uh, <laughs> a while now. ago. Okay, Tom, so I'm going to progress into the mid-1980s because all of a sudden we started seeing additional problems in chimneys, not from chimney fires, but from condensation caused by high-efficiency appliances. During the 60s, the 70s, times before that, there was never a time that chimneys were lined for central heating. But all of a sudden, we started to installing chimney liners, not from a safety aspect, but rather to contain the products of combustion and make sure that we didn't eat the chimneys alive because of the acids it produced. Do you remember that period of time? I was in Northeast Pennsylvania at the time that I was sweeping back there. The the entire area at one time was predominantly oil. And at, when like two or three years, like right early 80s, when it began, the natural gas was being piped in through the towns. We saw the transition going from oil chimneys to gas chimneys. And the amount of erosion, corrosion that was happening was unbelievable. How the gas was literally cleaning the interior of the chimneys out and depositing it all down at the base of the chimney. They were gooky. They were wet sometimes, you know, dry particles, flakes. Some, some of them were partially blocked already. And it was the, the interesting part of that is as the industry was working on all the other older gas appliances were, were um, either a pilot light and weren't used natural draft. There's always draft going through the chimney, which, which, uh, which kept it, uh, kept it moving. When you got into the higher efficiency appliances, less heat was going up the chimney, causing the more, more condensate problems issues. And especially if you're working with a, a material like this clay liner right here, um, it was, it was devastating how, how they, they tore the chimneys apart. Then later on the oil, based in the late eighties, when the oil started to come in with higher efficiency appliances, again, the same problems happened. They, instead of say, Six to seven hundred degree temperatures going up the chimney. It was now to down to, uh, you know, high fours to to low three hundreds. That's a dramatic change in the amount of energy efficiency that's saved in the home. But again, inside the chimney, they were cooling down way too fast and destroying chimneys. So right. I was I witnessed it a lot in, in, in back in those days. Right. So what we found out is in the research we've done, and between the two of us, I think you'd say we've done a pretty a great deal of research in our careers. But what we're finding today is today we have high efficiency wood burning appliances. We have high efficiency oil burning appliances using fuel oil. Hope that comes out right. People say I don't say oil properly because of my southern accent, but fuel oil, because gas and other fuels. So today when you see that you're going to be installing a high efficiency appliance it's probably going to require a high performance venting system that's designed to contain the products of combustion that's going to be properly sized that can assist in that appliance operating properly. And if you don't do that on our modern appliances, more than likely, a couple of things are going to happen. Number one, the appliance is not going to operate properly. Number two, it's going to use an excessive amount of fuel. Number three, you're going to produce a lot of condensates and acids. And number four, you're probably going to face replacement of your chimney prematurely. It's not going to live for its, for its anticipated 
lifespan, which is vastly important in today's world. Now, like I said, if you go back through, we've ta we talk about chimney fires today. And if you go back and review our last show, we talked about creosote. We talked about creosote removers. Now, Tom, let's stack those flue tiles back up for a minute, would you? Now, what I want to talk about now is a lot of times we will find that the flue tiles are missing mortar between the joints. Tom, would you agree that's a common occurrence? Yes. So when you look at these two flue tiles right now, they're not, you know, you can see that there is a gap there. And yes. in the last decade, maybe a little longer, there's a couple suppliers of material that a professional chimney sweep can now utilize to fill those joints. They have to be factory trained. The material they're using is not regular mortar. It's been designed to be installed and applied where it flows between those joints. So again, when you have problems, this is where my suggestion to you is make sure that you've got a trained, professional, qualified person offering an opinion on your chimney. The second thing is they should be showing you what the interior of your chimney looks like with a camera system, a video inspection device. Tom, do you consider that's pretty standard equipment for the chimney sweeps in America today? Yes. I really you know, I do. Manufacture them. Yes. It, it's, I, I don't know how you do the business without it. Be well, and, and to be honest with you, and Tom, Tom is not the only manufacturer that provides equipment. He is a leading manufacturer. He is an implementer. He is a person that's developed a lot. He is a person that I, he is my, he's a go-to guy for me. I mean, often if, and I think back and forth, he and I would a lot of time bounce information off, or if we have a problem and whatever, and trying to do research, it's not uncommon for Tom to reach out to me or for me to reach out to Tom to do this. This this is why I wanted Tom on here today. Tom does not sell chimney liners. Tom does not sell chimney repair products. Tom doesn't do chimney repair, just like I don't. I'm a consultant. I'm a coach. I'm an educator and a trainer. Tom is a trainer also. He's an educator, and he is a manufacturer of inspection devices to meet the criteria of what American consumers need to know today. So if you look at it, a lot of times who, you know, like I said earlier, people don't have their chimneys inspected as they should. And one of the things that the National Fire Protection Association, a association that is not from the chimney sweep industry does, they recommend that every chimney be inspected on an annual basis. And if you're sitting in your home today and your chimney has not been inspected, you need to do that. I'm also going to encourage you, you need to do it prior to every burning season before you for like that first fire. Don't just do it because you're getting it ready for Santa Claus in a, in a few more days. Okay. That's not, and those, a lot of people do that. And I want to caution you, people wait till the wrong time of the year. But what you should do at the end of each burning season, make chimney maintenance, chimney inspection, part of your spring cleaning operation. Call the chimney sweep in. Let's get the chimney inspected. Let's make sure there's no water entry pro problems. And we're going to talk about that on a future episode about chimney problems from water. Because what, if you noticed in this show, how many times have we talked about condensation? A lot. And that's one of the things. That's why we want to share with you. That's why we're doing this show in order to help American consumers understand what their chimneys can do, what the problems are, and how they have healthy chimneys in their home. Because if the chimney is not performing right, it has a chance of making your home unhealthy because we got flue gas spillage coming in the home. Tom, what would you add to this show about the importance of having your chimney, your venting system inspected on an annual basis? I think yeah. Tom just froze on me. There you are. Our cherry is one having every year, and the concept of being there, um, if you, if that can happen, many folks that's the availability of not being at the house at the time someone's there to, to service it. But um, it's really great when the homeowner is there and you, and you take the camera system out and you take you 
come through it. What you're doing scans, see what's going on inside the company. Tom, I gotta be, I gotta be honest. Your your internet is lagging really bad. Tom lives in rural Iowa. And one of the things that we need got to do one day is get Tom some decent internet service into Fairfield, Iowa. Right, but right, Tom. Well, on the outskirts, Fairfield inside town's got got terror or uh, T1 lines. Unfortunately, we can't get it to get out here yet in the in the rural areas. So hopefully, in the next five years, we should be able to see that we should also be able to get T1 lines. So, um, but okay. anyway, I guess that's the thing I want to want to do uh, reiterate is is that if you if you do do your due diligence by having someone look at your chimney on, on a periodic basis. If deterioration is going to start in a small way, you can gauge it from year to year to see whether or not sometimes you need to take actions right away or the fact we can make it to the point say, hey, um, you know, two to three years later on down the road, you might see that your mortar joints are eroding or this lander that maybe was questionable right now is in a place where it's not going to do its job. So yeah. that really yeah. gives you a timeline. I think that's important because – um, a lot of folks don't understand is that when you're going to sell a home, you know, the chimney, especially if it's a fireplace, can add anywhere between 5 to 10% more value to the home. That's if it's operating. And if it's not operating, that's becoming a liability, which is usually, unfortunately, found out at escrow. So yeah. I think that's really, really important that people understand that, that, you know, they spend a little bit of time and effort and some money maintaining the chimney. The long run, it isn't you've made the investment. You can, you know, retain that investment instead of losing it at escrow. Right. Tom, one of mine and your friends, Glenn Holler, made the following comment that's on one of the Facebook pages I'm monitoring right now. Many chimneys have exceeded their expected life. Liners mm -hmm. can expand the life of the structure. So that's what you're doing. You know, one of the things Tom and I teach in our classes, and again, we have taught thousands of people in our in our careers. And that's not, I don't think, I don't know of anybody that has probably taught more people than me and you, Tom, when we look at it. In fact, we used, you guys that listen may think this kind of funny. We used to bill ourselves as the Tom and Jerry show. And I always got mad because Tom always got top billing. But we used to do the Tom and Jerry show throughout the chimney sweep industry across the country, you know. And I've taught, and Tom has taught, we've taught in Reno, Nevada, Sacramento, California, St. Louis, you name it. We pretty well have traveled this country. So, this is the key thing. What do we teach chimney sweep technicians? To inspect the chimney for safety, to inspect it to make sure it's performing properly, and to make sure it's being properly maintained. And that's a real big issue in American chimneys, because I'm going to be honest with you folks. Many are not performing properly, and they are spilling flu gases that are making people sick in their homes. Many chimneys are not properly maintained. They're not protected from the elements. The elements are the rainwater, the freeze thaw, all, all the things that can go on. So this is the purpose of our show, to share with you things. And we're going to be doing more shows on a regular basis. If you are in the industry, please feel free to share this show on your social media. You know, sharing is caring, guys. That's how we're going to get the word out, okay? We're dependent on you guys that are in the industry to help put this show out there so we can educate more American consumers using social media, okay? So, Tom, getting ready to end this show. Anything you would add to it before we go away? Have a great holiday. Um, uh, thanks for the opportunity to be here today, Jerry. It's great. Yeah, as always, if you you know, want to tap me for some more information, love love to help you as best we can. But so, uh, but I, I wish everybody a very Merry Christmas, Happy Hanukkah, and Happy Holidays. There you go. And that was my friend that goes back many, many years, a colleague and someone that I get a lot of information from that's helped me tremendously in my career. And like he said, I want to also wish you the most happiest of Christmases, Happy Hanukkah, and a most prosperous new year. My name is Jerry Eisenhower. Our company is CVC Success Group. And what we do is we are coaches and we are educators. And our purpose in this show is to share information with the consumers of America so you are more better educated about your fireplaces, your chimneys, your gas logs, your appliances. So be sure and watch us on future episodes. 
The replays will stay up here. And I want to thank you very much. It is an honor. It's a privilege. And it's a pleasure every time I see that people are tuning in to us live like this. So thank you from the bottom of our hearts. And we will see you on our next show. 